Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is sponsored by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 20% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code FRAMERATE10. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly, all streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30 day trial, go to Netflix.com slash twit. Right? Yeah, exactly. And that and pivots. You see, because this is a symmetric, it can rotate without breaking, without break the locking. The locking doesn't break. Right. Because it's so it stays there on the the x and y, but not on, but the, it pivots on the yeah on the axis yeah. of the magnets. You see, if yeah. I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because it makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. It's astonishing. Can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just levitate it above the track quite high. And I can just rotate it. So it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it's not floating. It's locked above the surface. So it could pull, you could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, still fly around. Yeah, it could like this and it will just go around like this. Because I go and put it at different height. And then like this. Lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. I'll edit that. It's frame rate. Really Welcome to episode 47 of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. And I couldn't hear Brian. I, I totally, that's the problem, the music was still up. I said, hey, I'm Brian Brushwood, and I bet Dom can't hear this. And I couldn't. Wow, how do you do it? It's magic. It's, uh, this should be my full-time job, is doing magic. Really that's should. not what I think about You're it. So good I quit, it. Tom. I'm out of here. <laughs> All right, well, we got a replacement for you. Glenn Rubenstein is here, uh, hey, waiting in the wings. What's up, everybody? I'm so, always uh, standing by. Yeah, always thank you. I appreciate five that. Five minutes away. <laughs> good to have you along for the show today as well. Uh, wait, Brian's still here. Uh, you know what? I've decided I'm I'm coming out of retirement, and I'm going to take my place back as co-host. Well, it's an honor oh, to be back. Um, Glenn, stick around anyway. Okay, he might fine. quit later on in the show. You never know. Yeah. So we need you <laughs> have an <laughs> HP touchpad. I have an hands. HP, a ninety-nine dollar HP touchpad. It's all fancy. It's got the Google Docs on it. Well, this is an iPad tray. Now, will it work with that? You know, it's a little thicker. Yeah. But uh, let's oh, see. look at that! It's totally interoperable. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Crazy. All right. Uh, well. Frame rate is all about uh, frames and rating and cutting the cord. This is the show for aspiring cord cutters like like Brian and I, and like already cord cutters like many of you in the audience. Glenn, are you a? Have you cut the cord? Are you still? You know, the problem is for some reason inexplicably, I still pay two hundred fifty dollars a month for cable. Right. So like, but us, I get a lot of stuff. Did you're sitting there? You got the scissors. The cords right. And you're like. I, I dream of it every time I look at my cable. Bill. If you want to know the moment at which it is safe to cut the cord for everyone, keep watching this show and tell your friends. The more you All know. right, time to move on to the big story. This just in, the big story. The big story is a cord cutter's dream. Access to a movie you buy everywhere anywhere, uh, whether you have an internet connection or not, your television, your laptop, your mobile device, you shop, you add, you enjoy. It is movie nirvana. Television yeah. shows, movies. I love this idea. Physical media, you can get a Blu-ray or not. Ultraviolet will solve everything. Now, what is? how does it handle offline Capability like when you're not connected to the internet, when you're on an airplane, does it? Do you have to have a special ultraviolet enabled player, or how does it handle that? That's a great question, Brian. I'm glad you brought that up. When you're <laughs> offline, 
Ultraviolet works just like a movie in your DVD player. It plays. Are you doing a keynote right now? This is, <laughs> you have that same perfect tempo going on. Okay, so no, here's the, here's the, 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 the ultraviolet. promise of Ultraviolet is you will have to play it in a player. Like Flickster right now is the player. So you have to have okay. the Flickster app uh, or a Flickster, I think a Flickster website on your uh, on your laptop but you can download the file and just like an iTunes DRM file these these DRM files will play when you're offline that's awesome that's in every way that's all we've been asking for since day one so I have to assume since this is something that we love the idea of something that has perfect promise something that nails everything that consumers want I have to assume that nobody's adopting it is that uh, actually is that, oh. everyone but Disney and Apple are adopting it Really? Yeah. Now, why would and, 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 and Apple's allowing it through the back door because you can get the Flickster app on iOS devices, so they don't even have to to bother. Well, so so like what what content is available? And and uh, I mean, I guess uh, it says here the first ultraviolet enabled discs won't actually appear on shelves till tomorrow. Uh, but well, that was uh, back on October yeah, 10th. October 11th. Okay. Horrible bosses is the first movie. That's the problem. <laughs> I, I enjoyed Horrible and Bosses. there's the I, I thought, I thought it, it was okay. Uh, yeah, so right now, they don't have a lot of movies available. Yeah. You, have to, you have to buy optical discs to get it. They're not, they don't have their store up yet. Uh, but okay. but uh, it's coming on Green Lantern, yeah. I think. It's, coming on, it's already on Horrible Bosses. And, and the problem is that, that it, as it's been written about is that different studios might use different services for the streaming. So Flickster might be the place where you go for 20th Century Fox movies. Right. And Warner Brothers, uh, but you might have to get other apps if you want to watch something by Paramount. HBO has cleared the way for uh, uh, film studios uh, to use Ultraviolet for, for HBO shows. Uh, Warner Brothers Studios is making available that, that first movie, Horrible Bosses, uh, but they're, they're working with HBO so that HBO shows would be available on Ultraviolet. Again, you'd have to purchase them, you know. Which right. I like the idea. Yeah. I like the idea of not having to keep buying the same media in different formats whenever I want to watch it. Um, as it is, I mean, it, it's insane if you think about how many of us invested so heavily in DVD libraries only to have to turn around and uh, buy Blu-ray copies of the same film and then potentially buy digital copies if we were in a pinch and we wanted to be able to watch it legally. You know, the so, fact that this is only on optical discs right now makes it ludicrous, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. a nice perk if you want to buy the Blu-ray anyway because yeah. it does give you a, a way to watch the movie in other locations and it's a, a step in the right direction. When they actually have the ultraviolet store, I want to see this in use over multiple movies and multiple television shows. Yeah. Uh, because my, my belief with DRM is it always fails in unexpected ways <laughs> that get in your way of enjoying the things you own and drive you to considering using illegal means because those won't fail. Okay, so real quick, and on that subject here, uh, WB Height in the chat room says, uh, I'm still in the no DRM camp. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I just don't think piracy is that big of a problem. Uh, here's the thing. We're not fans of DRM either, but we recognize that there's sort of a growing pain that you have to go through. Let's just hope that Ultraviolet is the iTunes moment for video, where iTunes, yes, it had restrictive DRM and there were problems with it, but it was such a massive commercial success that, uh, that they had the leverage down the road to say, you know what, DRM is silly. Let's stop doing it. Let's, maybe that's what Ultraviolet can be for video and it's like I, if I have to, to vote between being able to buy something legally with DRM and genuinely be able to watch it anywhere versus the, uh, the, the video industry not even playing ball at all, I'd rather have them play ball with DRM and eventually see how silly it is than not even get them to step forward and have piracy be the only viable option. You know what the different mindsets are like? I was thinking about this the other day. It's, it's sort of like you know the Professor X versus the Magneto mindset. And I think people that, that pirate and that are very against DRM and sort of the Magneto by any means necessary mindset of we want the equality of our digital media in any format. And the Professor X mindset is saying, you know, that if we work with them, if we play ball as consumers and are willing to deal with these DRM missteps and sort of embrace these new technologies, eventually the studios are going to come around to accepting that we want our digital media in any format on any device whenever we want it. So this mutant is. rights comes through using DRM. But it, de eventually it depends on which philosophy you subscribe DRM. to. Yeah, not it depends on which this philosophy. is an amazing analogy. This will fundamentally shift my understanding and my thinking of this. You are absolutely right. Working within the system, you, you may be able to see results, but it may just be this agonizing circle that goes nowhere. But, uh, but if you go all Magneto on it, then, uh, then you run the risk of being completely shut out of the system altogether. This is brilliant.
Yeah, no, it's exactly what's going on. Because because the Magneto one's easy, right? Yeah. Like, oh, I'm going to flaunt the law and do whatever I want for my own ends. But the Professor X is the key to the brilliance of this because it says, no, I actually want the change. It's the heart I of still want the same goal Magneto wants. Acceptance right. of mutants or, in this case, ridding of DRM. Yeah. But I'm going to work with the establishment to get it. Uh, I, you know, uh, ultraviolet is, it's, it's a sign of progress. I don't think it's the ultimate thing. Uh, no, but I, I don't but think it's, it's nice. the end. It's game. a nice step in yeah. the right direction. I, I get so tired of rebuying things in new and different formats. What I think is interesting, though, is to look at it is right, just, uh, keep in mind, though, yeah. real quick. Uh, there's nothing about ultraviolet that I think promises that you're not going to rebuy all this again. When oh, they yeah, do, yeah. you know, 4K rescans of print film, your your you, ultraviolet is not going to entitle you to the upgrade in quality. You'll have to buy your favorite movies again. No, but the future. idea is when you buy an ultraviolet movie, you then own it in ultraviolet in all the current forms. So you yeah, may not correct. own that 4K version, but you own the HD version in digital, right. and if you bought the optical disc in optical disc, in perpetuity. Well, and it's, as someone who has a ton of DVDs, it is sort of a pain to even have to rip those to watch them digitally. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll be honest, that I'm sure. I'm, yeah, it's well, a total pain. And I'm sure, like many of you, I felt entitled to maybe get a less than legal digital copy because I figured you I, I own the DVD. Right. And you just, you know. And that's the thing. That's what they haven't accepted yet. And I actually think they get it. They just haven't brought themselves to accept, which is we actually want them to make it easier for us. Yeah. And then we will give them money. And, and it's not about, like, oh, I'm just going to use BitTorrent because it's free. That's not the only thing. Yeah. If it's easier to pay, we will do it, and, and right. iTunes proved that. You are Absolutely. frozen with a big old smile on your face, Brian Brushwood. Oh, there we go. Oh, am I frozen? Oh, okay, now I'm back. I'm just, I'm just frozen with excitement over the potential for ultraviolet. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if a few years ago you had said, well, all the studios need to do is, is come up with an idea that allows you to buy a movie once and then you own it in all forms, everyone would have said they'll never do that because they want to charge you multiple times for the same version. And yeah. they did, but what they realized is that's not working. So this, this, let's give the studios credit. This is a small step of them saying, okay, we're actually not going to make more money by trying to trick you into buying it millions of times because then you're just going to get weary and stop buying it altogether. So let's give you what you want and then maybe you'll spend more money on us. Absolutely. I think Absolutely. what's interesting, though, is in this case, I mean, do they think of the digital copy in Ultraviolet as almost like an afterthought to get you to buy the DVD? Because remember, a lot of DVDs already come with the digital copy, but you can't... They come with an iTunes copy. Well, they come with some... Or some, in some cases, will play on more Universal more. didn't for a while, didn't they come with some weird DRM proprietary oh, right, yeah. like copies? These useless copies. But the yeah. idea that you can stream it on any device that can run the app, that's what I like. The idea that it's not locked in to just watching it on your computer. Yeah, you know. uh, and I, so, you know, this is definitely not the perfect system. The perfect no, system not. would be freaking get rid of DRM. Just have a locker yeah. that says you own it, you bought it, you own it, uh, and get rid of DRM and stop worrying. It's like the people, it's the opposite, I thought about this today, it's the opposite of the hope that if I get on TV, I'll be famous, right? <laughs> it's like the people are like, ooh, I got on the news, and now I'm famous, and then they realize, no one recognizes yeah. me on the street. No one right. saw the report. Even the people who saw the report didn't pay attention to know that was me. You don't get immediately famous by being on TV. Same way, you don't lose all of your sales just by removing DRM. It's, yeah. a, it's a false fear. No, it's true. All right, let's move on to another big story. Stop everything. It's another big story. This is a uh, pre-taped segment I did back at Comic-Con in July. We've been holding on to it uh, for quite a while, trying to find the right time to play it. It's a great interview right with day. Edward Thomas, uh, production designer at Doctor Who. And I'll let you just hear what he has to say. Hi, I'm Tom Merritt. We're here with Edward Thomas, production designer on uh, all the seasons of the reboot. Of, well, not a reboot, but the new Doctor Who uh, and the, uh, the Torchwood series as well. Are you working on Miracle Day as well? Uh, yes, I do. I worked on Miracle Day. We've just completed that. So, uh, yeah, I did all first five seasons of Doctor Who, and I've done all four seasons of Torchwood. And then also a smaller show called Sarah Jane Adventures, which is another spin-off. Uh, I know our, our audience is big fans of all of the Doctor Who stuff. Uh, 
Does this mean that you designed the TARDIS? I, I've actually designed two TARDIS. I'm very lucky. I, I got the, the chance to have a second shot at it, which I was really pleased about. Because when uh, we've been through, through doctors, three doctors during my time, and um, uh, we weren't lucky enough to have a, a, a new TARDIS for David Tennant's doctor, but when it came to Matt Smith, it was decided that it was a new, new TARDIS. So, yeah, I had a, a chance to do, to do two. Now, as I understand it, you were a Doctor Who fan as, as a kid as well. Uh, I, I, suppose I, wa I suppose I was. I suppose if you live in Britain um, and you're, you know, between the ages of six and 15, you have to be, you know, um, because it's such great television, it's such great drama. I mean, I, I certainly got memories of sitting on a sofa with my mum and dad and in between them and being terrified, you know, when that music came on. And, uh, but, um, but it wasn't ingrained, instilled in me really, you know, which I think was probably a good thing because if I'd, if I'd realised taking on the job, the scale of the job I was taking in on and the fact that the fans were so passionate, as all sci-fi fans are, but Doctor Who fans seem to have this incredible ability to... Um, to just, you know, hold on every word, you know. And I think if I'd realized that, I might have, I might have actually passed on the job, you know. <laughs> well, the, co the collective knowledge and memory of the series of the fandom is, is more than any one man can match. Oh, absolutely. And, and the thing is, what's great about it is that, you know, it has its benefits because you've got 45 years almost of shows that have gone in the past, with, which, which, which you can draw from or not draw from, depending on what, what you felt, you know. And, and when, I came to, when it came to designing the TARDIS, both TARD, TARDIS, or TARD I suppose you should call them, um, I really wanted to be not, not true to necessarily the materials that we, that we used in the past, but definitely to sort of the fact that, that the shape and the systems and, you know, where the door was and, and the central co console and those sorts of things. But other than that, I wanted to change it totally, you know. And the most radical thing was actually to make it suggest that, that you grow a TARDIS, you don't build a TARDIS, you know. A bit of a change. And then the, uh, cha it, they, it was described in the, in the show as changing the desktop background so to speak uh, is that something that that came from your production design or or was that just yes yeah absolutely you know we, we started with a blank piece of paper um, and just and, and just the ideas and we sat around the table the concept artists we had some great concept artists all through the show um, but we were very lucky to have a concept artist a guy called Brian Hitch who's a huge cartoon cartoon uh, cartoonist uh, does a lot for, uh, for I think uh, M DC comics and this sort of thing and so he came on board very early and we just really just sat down and drummed out all the ideas and and it was amazing how, how quickly we came to the idea of, 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 of this thing being an organic machine and you know it's 500 years old, you know. If, if, you had a, if you had a car that was 500 years old, there would be nothing left on it. You know, it would just be a, a mush, of, a mess of things that you, that you add on to it. And, and so the idea was that, that there was nothing new about this TARDIS. It was basically a collection of things that the Doctor had sort of got over the years. And there were modern things on there. There was, because the thing is, the TARDIS doesn't recognize design. You know, the TARDIS is an intelligent machine. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't care whether the buttons are all the same color. It's not... It's not a spaceship, you know. Um, it's not designed by somebody. It's it's literally becoming into being, you know. Well, and that explains why the doctor has so much trouble uh, piloting it sometimes, right? It has a mind of its own. Well, again, because most spaceships, uh, I suppose, would be would be flown by more than one people, a person. So uh, my idea was is that the TARDIS was actually probably originally designed to be flown by six people. So hence, hence there's six sides to the TARDIS. So each person would have had a a job to do on that TARDIS. So there would have been six Time Lords and they would have all piloted it and everything would have been great. And that gave us that great moment where we did get to have six pilots. Exactly, exactly. You are a fan. <laughs> yeah, and so the Doctor, you know, and what I wanted to, you know, I wanted the Doctor to feel as if he was at the helm of a ship. So he had to run around and it was very, it was very active, um, you know, and he had to pull buttons and levers and he designed in such a way that he could kick this and hit that and, and it just, just brought the whole space to life, you know. So, um, yeah, so that was one of, one of, the, one of the ideas that we had. Now, production design, would, would you define that as the responsibility for how things look on camera, or how, how would you defi design, define it? I think it's a bit of both, you know, it's a, it's a bit of sort of good housekeeping, and then it's, a, it's making sure that the visual is really exciting, you know, um, um, uh, you know it, everything starts with a budget, unfortunately, as, as most things do, you know, um, and then it's just about getting over that putting that to one side, not allowing anybody within the department to sort of worry about those things because at the end of the day it's your responsibility um, and sort of just getting the best out of people um, and then working backwards, you know, bringing it in line and, and sometimes you have to lose things, sometimes you can gain things, you know, but it re really the, you know, the, 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 the role of the production designer is to absolutely deliver what the exec producers, the showrunners, uh, what their vision was in the first place, you know, and, and I think you're chosen because of that, you know, your style. Um, and in TV, uh, the directors come along sort of 
at a later date, really. You know, it's a bit more formulaic. It's not like a feature film where you get a, a director that works with a producer. Really, the, the directors come on board later. So you, so you, you work very closely as a, product, with a, as a production designer with the execs. And does that cause any problems when a d director comes along and they're working with an inherited design and they say, well, I want, I want to change this? And you're like, eh, I don't know if you really want to do that. Yeah, I mean, I've been very lucky because most of the directors that have come onto, sh onto, onto Doctor Who, you know, the show has been... Um, I mean, I left Doctor Who a year ago, so I, I'm, I'm not, no longer involved now, but during my time, you know, um, everybody just wanted to work on it. You know, and then they totally got it. You know, the directors totally got it. Yes, they. Yeah, yeah, it is lucky. You know, yes, they might want to put their own stamp on it. But again, on a series as a production designer, you're there to police that. You know, you're there to make sure that, you know, what the Doctor, you know, eleven lives. You know, you have to make sure that the continuity is there. And that spilled over into Tortured as well and Sarah Jane. Um, is that you know, I, I, I had to be the production designer on all those shows because there were so many overlaps in the shows, and it would be it would have been impossible for anyone else to have sort of to have known all the idiosyncrasies in the crossover. So the teams worked on all the shows. It was now, great getting to talk to Edward Thomas. Uh, really enjoyed that he, he took so much time to sit down with us. If you want to see the, the rest of the interview, we talked for a few more minutes after that. Uh, go to youtube.com and search Edward Thomas uh, twit or uh, just go to our show notes, twit.tv slash fr. We'll have the link to the YouTube video in there. And if you're not a fan of Doctor Who, as I wasn't until a few years ago, let me recommend the episode Blank. Oh, yeah. That is the Absolutely. ultimate gateway episode. Totally That's what agree. got me into the show and really convinced me that it was worth giving the new series a chance. I had all these preconceptions about it from the old series and going to comic conventions when I was younger, yeah. just thinking it was sort of this weird British thing I didn't quite understand. But then watching Blink just really, really sold me on the series. 100% agree. All right, let's take a quick break and uh, thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. You know what I, I did, uh, Brian? Uh, well, what I've done many times is uh, challenge people like go to squarespace.com, sign up for an account, make a business website for somebody, and then sell it to them. I can't hear you. What? Yeah. I was so excited I accidentally muted myself. That's so, how crazy wow. it was. So this guy did. And he, he, uh, it was a guy in Texas, actually, at a Chicago-style hot dog restaurant, just went on to Squarespace, signed up for the free trial, and then uh, made a website for the hot dog place, showed it to the owner, and the owner was like, oh my god, that's amazing. And the owner bought the Squarespace account, got the discount by using the code framerate 10, so got the 20% off six months. And that now is awesome. the owner's got a website, this guy's got a budding career, because he's like, you know, he's got a client now. Uh, Dude, and, and I don't even know, like, like that sounds like a like a con, but it's really not. You're just you're providing a valuable service and Brian to be a know. middleman yeah, right. to bring the <laughs> awesome technology of uh, Squarespace to people who otherwise wouldn't ever have thought that they could do awesome looking websites. Because of course that's the big thing about Squarespace is that they're able to make really awesome professional looking websites. Even if you have no experience, the templates are phenomenal. Uh, they got dozens of different designs. And of course you can update from your iPhone, your, uh, your Android device, your mobile while you're on the go. Squarespace is the best thing ever. Yeah, so uh, you know you don't have to spend anything except a little time. It's not even that much time to set up a website. If you wanted to try this out, you're not losing anything. Squarespace.com. 14-day trial, absolutely free. Go sign up. You can import a blog. If you've got access to the blog, you can import it, see what it looks like. Uh, and definitely, if you decide to keep it, use that code, FRAMERATE10, and you get 20% off your uh, service for I think, six months. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm just double checking wow. that. Yeah, 20% off for six months with that code, wow. FRAMERATE10. So we thank Squarespace for their support of FRAMERATE. Let's go on to film. Foul. Web7295 says, you know, I tried that at my local Burger King and it didn't work. You might not be so successful with huge corporate chains. Just, just a thing. All right. Uh, Cameron Diaz starred in Bad Teacher. Uh, and besides that, we have other things to say about this. It's, uh, <laughs> it's coming early to Apple and Amazon. Already selling, Sony's already selling digital copies. Uh, of the of the movie in iTunes, Amazon, Xbox, and other platforms before the DVD came out. Now, is this a case where they're trying to be a pioneer or trying to goose digital distribution, or is this a case where they acknowledge that pirate copies tend to leak before the physical DVDs even come out, and they figure, well, screw it, let's go ahead and compete in that last week right before the DVD comes out to where at least we'll have a legal alternative? 
I think it's an experiment. I think Definitely. what they I think what they're doing is saying, okay, we got all these schmucks like Tom Merritt and Brian Brushwood and Glenn Rubenstein out there telling us to change the way we do things. Let's test it. Let's put one out before the DVD so we can show how horrible the sales are, and then we can, well, maybe they're not going to prejudice it, but they're going to say, look, let's see what kind of effect it has. But at the same time, as someone who's been a bit of a digital rights Magneto in the past, keeping, keeping you know, kind of a foot in both waters, I mean, I'll remind you that Magneto led the X-Men for a while, so he came around. Yeah, you know, no, he was part of the team. He's gone back yeah. and forth. Uh, I've, I've noticed that movies tend to leak when the screeners are released a few months before the home video release, so I think it's very wise for them to try and get ahead of that. And for legal digital copies before the physical copy comes out because a lot of people pay attention to that. I don't know if Bad Teacher is the best you know, These test. are terrible movies. It's that not a scientific test. For, but you know, here's the problem. What's the, the control for Bad the, Teacher? Is it horrible bosses? It may very well may be. <laughs> Although, you know, Bad Teacher is one of those that I've been meaning to watch. I almost watched it on the flight when I went on vacation recently, but uh, just for some reason just never quite in the mood to, to actually check it out. Yeah, that's one of those things where it's like uh, there's no way you're going to get somebody to do a bold experiment like this with a big release. That that's going to be they're going to be as conservative and as safe as they possibly can. Yeah. But then when they throw it, uh, you know, this uh, lower lower tier movie out like this, it just it puts them in a position where if it doesn't do well, you're like, see, it didn't it didn't work. But to be fair, yeah. it did well enough. I mean, it did make some money over the summer. I mean, it's not like they're doing this with a you know one of these yeah. complete lesser known films. It's not a you B know. film. Yeah. Is it? Uh, what did it end up doing in the summer movie draft? I no idea? I don't think it was in the it summer movie. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't. Really? Yeah, it, was, yeah, it did make the cut. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I know. <laughs> uh, next year, Alan Turing turns 100, or he would if yes. his brain had been preserved in a machine that had artificial intelligence. <laughs> and in a celebration of the event, Warner Brothers has outbid the other studios for a script based on Andrew Hodges' Alan Turing, The Enigma, the, the scuttlebutt around Hollywood is that Alan Turing, the pioneer of the Turing test of whether something is intelligent, uh, and beyond that, just a, a, an incredible and really, pioneer really, of computer the father, science. The father of, yeah, the, the father of the very idea of the microcomputer, long exactly. before we had the technology to do these things. Essentially, every computer we have is, uh, when it's reduced to its base components, is essentially what was predicted by Alan Turing's work. A Turing machine. Uh, yeah. The scuttlebutt is Leo plays him, not Leo Laporte. Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Maybe it should be Leo Laporte. Actually. I think Leo would, Leo Laporte would be a better choice, personally. What do you think? DiCaprio no, is Turing. Dude. First, first of all, Leo, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't. I, I know he started off as a pretty boy, but that guy knows how to pick movies. Yeah. I don't think I've watched I outside agree. of the beach. I don't think I've watched a single Leonardo DiCaprio movie that I didn't enjoy. Did you uh, see him so, on the final season so, of Growing Pains? No, I missed have, that. It was fantastic. Such to have a, to to, to have the story of of uh, Alan Turing told, which which the whole saga from, you know, from uh, his his early work, and and again, it may be the kind of thing where they barely even acknowledge, you know, the, the brilliance of his works, or or specifically teach any of the amazing ideas that he had. But certainly, the fact that he was a a legally prosecuted homosexual in England, and eventually, after being chemically castrated, and and in, I, I don't know if he was imprisoned or not, but certainly had to go through a hell of a lot. To where finally commit suicide with uh, by eating a cyanide laced apple. In fact, it's rumored that's what the apple logo is with a bite out of it. Is that it was inspired by um, you know I'm sure this is totally apocryphal, but it's supposed to be uh, Alan Turing's suicide apple. It's I an amazing story. That, that yeah. is not true. <laughs> I, that's that's the rumor around the campfire. Is yeah. what uh, is, is what people also. Like to if say. you look at the apple very closely, you'll see the number 23. Yes. <laughs> Just look. Uh, Warner Brothers also bid on Rome Sweet Rome, a historical sci-fi saga. Now, why, why do you care other than it's historical sci-fi? This was started on Reddit, yes. of all places. Uh, author James Irwin posted the question, could I destroy the Roman Empire with a U.S. Marine battalion? That's a short version of the question. Uh, and then posted his reply in the form of a short story <laughs> on Reddit. It then took off, everybody contributing, uh, becoming this sort of uh, flash fic, uh, and, and it became a huge hit. Within days, Irwin saw his story receive its own subreddit just for that question, where readers created fan art. Uh, there's even a mock-up of movie trailers already. And so now Warner Brothers has uh, bought the rights for the story from You him. know, let me tell you, 
if I were a film or TV producer with a little bit of money to burn, um, I would option a lot of the stuff I've seen in Reddit threads. Like, there have been some great ones, like, what's the most awkward thing you've ever had an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend do during a relationship? There's some, like, you know, what's the most embarrassing moment you've had? So people post some stories in there that are funnier than anything I have seen on television or in movies. In it's reality years. is stranger than fiction. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, totally. totally. <laughs> and I've, I've but, thought about it, and I've even I was talking about it with my wife, and I was like, "There's some people, you know, because I've been thinking lately about about doing uh, some more creative writing or a screenplay or something. I've been thinking like, should I message some people and offer them, you know, a hundred bucks to sort of option this story? Because there's some great set pieces in there. They're just so funny. And well, I, but, but that's I've just been it, thinking is, it's is, a matter of time. Until this happens. legally, legally, you're asking for uh, a nightmare to do that yeah. because. If, if you're setting a precedent where, because I mean, you can't, you can copyright the words to a story. You can't copyright yeah. the essence of what made it funny. So really, that's what writers do that all the time at, at cocktail parties. They hear these amazing stories, and then they show up months later in scripts that they throw out, and they forget who they even heard heard it from. If uh, to go out and and to pay someone a hundred dollars for the rights or whatever, number one would would make everybody feel entitled and it would actually invite people to start suing your production company well, I think based it's on a more ethical works. way to do it though could you imagine as a comedy writer if you wrote a screenplay and there were similarities some stuff that had been put well first off reddit would take you down i think reddit would make it their mission yeah you know and there, there are enough dedicated people dedicated people on reddit redicated yeah reddit that's good i like it. <laughs> There are enough of redicated folk out there that I think that if you if you plagiarize something from a Reddit thread, I think that's asking for huge trouble. I think that's the only ethical way to do it would be to offer someone, you know, even a pittance, yeah. uh, you know, to get a blessing for it. But there are some very detailed stories. It's not just a simple idea. People write with such fine detail in, in a lot of these personal experience threads that, uh, you know, I've been thinking it's a matter of time till something like this happens. So it's, it's great with Rome Sweet Rome that we're starting to see Reddit as a source now. No, well, see, and again, the only reason that it works with Rome Sweet Rome is because it's one guy's idea, and then yeah. they are able to buy that one guy's idea. But what you're describing, where there's a Reddit where everyone posts their own hilarious joke, I mean, there's there's no way. There's it, it, It's insane hmm. to even try to go down that road. Although you you've got only... that issue with Rome Sweet Rome, yeah. where there's a lot of this story has been contributed by fans in the subreddit. So do you think that rises as an issue? down the line if they start to use pieces in the movie and someone says, hey, wait a minute, that wasn't from the yeah, author. See, that's, that's that was my comment. That's crowdsourced in a unique way. What I'm talking about is taking an individual comment that I think works as a short story almost yeah. and optioning that to include it in a Well, I'm just story. saying Warner Brothers has to be careful even yeah. in this instance, oh, definitely. I think. Yeah. All right, Dan Trachtenberg, we, you, you probably know him from Totally Rad Show, but um, he is uh, the guy who directed The Portal video that we showed the portal yeah, yeah the, like short control movie yeah. yeah uh and he has been hired uh by chris morgan to direct sci-fi action heist film crime of the century this is a real honest to goodness hollywood movie uh but based on how well the portal film did dan trachtenberg's getting paid couldn't have that's I, awesome i'm excited for dan no kidding uh, look, Dan is sincerely one of the greatest guys in all of new media. He's one of the coolest people, one of the nicest people. And I think this is a case where everyone has so much love for him that, that we're all just overjoyed that he's got, that he's been given this shot at the big leagues. But on, on the flip side, though, even if I didn't know him at all, it's this is this he's he's followed the track that usually leads to getting a feature film you know he's done a whole bunch of commercial work mm. and the only difference is is that uh is that we've been watching him grow yeah right yeah. exactly he kind of feel like he's one of our own and that's the thing and i think yeah. he has a body of work it's not like he just did a fan film no, it's not like he posted like one film. film and got take you're right he did he actually uh, they, they mentioned in the story on slash film uh he did more than you can chew for black box tv mm -hmm. back in august uh, and he created the concept for for this move for crime of the century as well. He's been developing it with Daniel Kunkka. Uh, so yeah, he's he's been he's been hitting the pavement. He's been working hard. But sometimes when you have a body of work, then it takes something to put it over the top, and yeah, exactly. that's how you really go to the next level. You can, your body of work could be, from the actor point of view, it could be like McDonald's commercials. Yeah. But you don't want it to be. You want it to become <laughs> television shows, and then once it's television shows, you want it to become movies. And so you know what we're seeing is Dan moving from one level to another, which is but great. Occasionally we see people that do like one thing and that just takes off and becomes you know a calling card that leads them right you know just literally off of like one viral video but it's I think it's really great when you see someone that's been putting in the time effort and energy and then they do something and then it takes them takes off anyway well, and that's, we, we don't know much about the, the movie itself it's a high octane heist with a science fiction twist sounds good to me yeah you're gonna say Brian 
No, I was, I was going to say down with science fiction. I hate anything that's cool. I hate anything that's science fiction. I think this has no chance to succeed. Oh, well, then you're, you're going to be unhappy about what's happening to Brian Singer. <laughs> oh, dude, this blew me away. I actually do want to talk about this. Yeah, uh, Brian Singer, uh, who, who sent us this? My, my, uh, my... I, I think this came over Twitter. It came uh, over Twitter over, from... over the weekend. Are you looking at the lineup? Because I can't see... No, I'm, I'm not. You know, you're uh, looking at the lineup every second? Okay, this came <laughs> from Darth Galt. Thank you, Darth Galt. Brian Singer says because Excalibur got canceled, because there's just too much Arthurian legend being made right now, uh, he is going to focus his efforts on a feature film adaptation of Battlestar Galactica. Sweet. Uh, now, now this is exciting. You hear that and you're like, oh, good, more Battlestar Galactica from a talented uh, filmmaker. But then you read below, a little twist in there, you're like, oh, BT dubs, it will be based on <laughs> the, the original, original yeah. Battlestar Galactica, not on the 2003 now, reboot. That, that doesn't know. mean it will star Lauren Green. If it, all, no. <laughs> but it means that he isn't going to try to get Edward James Olmos. Uh, yes. Well, and, and I wonder... Now I wonder so it will be a, a third version of Battlestar Galactica, essentially. And I'm kind of okay with this. I mean, this is the kind of thing, like, remember, this is one of the things that we want to see more of, uh, as we talked about with the, the, the rights management for Star Wars. You know, we wish that the, that the copyright could expire on the Star Wars universe so that everyone could start reinventing new Star Wars-type stories. Um, so, so really, I should be happy that there's yet another... Battlestar Galactica, but as somebody who was such a fan of the 2003, yeah. kind of kills me to see that rejected. I, I like extensions more than reboots, I have to say. Yeah. You know, I'm more of a fan of extending the universe. And even with Star Wars, I mean, with the expanded universe with the novels, even though I haven't read uh, more than, than a handful, I really like that there's so much additional material out there that exists in the same universe. I, my fear when I see this, this caveat is that when you think about all of the same television shows from that era that have been turned into movies, what do you think? You think Starsky and Hutch. You yeah. think A-Team. You think Land of the Lost. Those were all turned into hilarious comedic send-ups of the original. Right. Winks and nods. So that's to, not what's going to happen let's just here, hope right? This paves the way for a Buck Rogers movie. <laughs> Made lady, lady, lady. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do Tweaky. Let's move on to Tube Tubs. <laughs> How are you going to get that internet television on your television? Well, how about a Roku box for 50 bucks? 50 bucks? 50 bucks! The new LT model uh, will add HBO Go streaming to all of its boxes this month. Of course, you have to actually subscribe to cable for HBO Go to work, so that's not yeah, going to Yeah, that's kind of an interesting... Most, yeah. wait, if, if you subscribe to cable, then you probably have uh, HBO On Demand. And if you have HBO On Demand, what's, what, what does HBO Go have that HBO On Demand doesn't? Another room... Actually, oh, it has a lot of back, yeah. it actually has it a, a lot of than, back episodes yeah. and old series that aren't available on demand. Well, and also, uh, not that I, I would expect a lot of people would use HBO Go if they maybe don't have cable service themselves, but maybe a close friend or family member does. That would uh, be against the that's terms going to, of service. You're, you're Brian. I mean, the it, brother it, of it evil mutants. Magneto. Yeah. <laughs> and you. I mean, let's face it. The, uh, I, I got to assume that that at some point somebody has used a Roku box for uh, for a Magneto like solution. I just want to say you put the Nito in Magneto. <laughs> <laughs> That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me, Tom. Oh, shucks. Uh, Netflix uh, has uh, locked in a full slate of teen angst, according to paid content. Uh, Four-year pact with The CW. Now, keep in mind, Time Warner is a part owner of The CW with CBS. Mm -hmm. uh, Time Warner are the folks out there saying Netflix you know, has no right to exist and is going to die. But CW has signed on with Netflix. A uh, four-year pact covers all past seasons, no current seasons, of <laughs> Gossip Girl, Vampire Diaries, plus any future shows that debut by the 2014-15 season. Now, I don't know what the specifics are, but I highlighted a quote here that stood out for me. As for CW, Moonves told the LA Times, this one deal essentially makes the CW a profitable enterprise. Now, I don't know if that means like from inception all the way up to now, or, or if it's a case where they were in the right. red, but now they're in the black before it. But, uh, but we're hearing a lot of stories about this where Netflix is taking a lot of properties that are right on the brink and they're making the difference to keep them alive. So this is, even though these aren't the kind of shows I'll be watching yeah, on Netflix, it, it has me excited to see them doing the right thing to keep stuff going. I love me some teen angst, but I don't really watch anything on the CW now that Smallville's off there. Yeah, Smallville was a lot. Oh, and you know what? I'm watching The Ringer. Oh, how is that? Yeah, well, it's, it's okay. 
I'm surprised I'm still watching it. It's one of those things where it's like, <laughs> I watched the first that's, episode. That's a box quote right there. I'm surprised I'm still watching it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I watched the first episode. I'm like, okay, this is competent. It's all right. Yeah. I'll watch the second. I watch the second. I'm like, you know, I don't think I'm going to keep watching this. But then I'm like, I found myself watching the third and then mm. the fourth. You, and- you know what I was just told is now on Netflix Instant Streaming, which will be like, this will be a problem for me, how it's made. How it's made now on that Netflix. show. Oh my God! If I'm if I'm looking for something to just put me to sleep, how it's made is is just a visual quaalude. It is just amazing. What are you talking to watch about? It. It's the best show ever. It, for like, every one so interesting up. segment, it's like it's just so slow with the pacing and the music. It's perfect. It's the perfect <laughs> show because it's like, hey man, you want to know how aluminum foil is made? I'm like, hell yeah, I do. And it's just like, it's just it's visually, it's just oh man, it's I the feel best. Like, show. I feel like it could be a really great 30 second online video if they just compressed it a little bit. Oh, you know, it's so sad. It, it's just so slow. So I, li- I really liked that show when it was called The Tech Of on Tech TV. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Factory oh. Made, I find Factory Made more interesting than how it's made. Uh, the uh, tech wizards behind Kazaa and BBC's iPlayer, Anthony Rose, has unveiled a new project called Zbox. He was speaking on a panel at MIPCOM last week in Cannes and declared that the future of television would be based on personalized recommendation uh, he says, my starting proposition is that people hate choice. Either a trusted source says, here's the one, or it can be the force of overall everyone what they're watching, the most popular, or what specific friends are watching, or it can be a recommendation service. Everything from here on is about tweaking the balance between these propositions. Now, I think Rose is ahead of the game here. He may be too far ahead of the game, but he's on to something, which is once we get all of these services like Netflix and Hulu and whatever else comes along to provide us the ability to watch whatever we want whenever we want, we're going to need we're we're not going to want to face the choice of yeah. that anymore. We're going well, to want a portal to tell us, okay, what's good. Yeah. We, we've been talking about this for a while. I think there's a place for, uh, for for curators of content. And I think to some degree, we're already seeing that right now. There are certain names that I trust on Twitter who, when I see them blogging about, you know, uh, you know about this Breaking Bad or that whatever, then I'm like, well, man, maybe I better check out that show. Uh, I think that many of these tastemakers will carve out a niche for themselves as as essentially channel distributors. And of course, there'll be corporate ones as well that I think will be perceived as less trustworthy. But I think he's right in that secretly we all hate choice because it makes it into work. We don't want TV to be work. But the application that he's talking about here I, I didn't really follow it. It sounded like it sounded like homework being added to whatever you were watching. <laughs> well, no. It, what, what, the way I understand it, the way Zbox is going to work, it's going to the first iteration will be an app. Uh, it'll be the, either iOS or Android, and then it will be hooked into your TV somehow. Now I don't know if it's going to be some third-party remote switch or it's an app that has to be installed on your television, but it will be a guide based on social networks like Twitter that will tell you what's hot and what's you know what what fits your tastes, and then you'll actually be able to change your television channel from that app to what the hot thing that so, everybody's I mean, watching. essentially, and I guess this is what I don't like because essentially this is a glorified 21st century TV guide. That's what the TV guide was for, is to tell you what to watch. And now we just have the same thing on an iPad. So I, I think it's the right idea, but I'm not happy with the implementation as well, I see it so far. It sounds to me kind of like what Spotify's been doing with Facebook, the idea that you could have in a feed, uh, what, yeah, what your right. friends are watching. And they, don't they offer that overseas with Netflix, but they can't do it in the US because of some archaic law? That's right. Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a law that Reed Hastings was saying well, we have to get this changed before I can uh, yeah. be allowed to be happen in the U.S. But it sounds interesting to me. I mean, I find I, that a lot of the times that people. Uh, I mean, I find actually a lot of posts on Facebook where people talking about what should I watch between this or this or what should I watch, and people sort of crowdsourcing you know ideas for uh, for shows to check. My out. problem with this is the Nito factor is yeah. being able to see what's hot and then watch it right then, and that only is going to be true for live events. Most people don't watch television shows live because they don't want to watch the commercials. Well, and actually, hold on, hold on. Hold on. I mean, that is also. that is our perception as people on the internet. But we've covered this story before, and by the numbers, a shocking number of people do watch television live, and that's what we want to see change. Do you watch television live? You listening right now? I'm in your ears. You on the video? I'm looking at you. <laughs> Framerate show at gmail.com. We want to hear. Yeah, dude, we need to get lots of feedback from you guys. Uh, also, uh, Skype freed up Janice Fries and Nicholas Zenstrom to do something new. Uh, they have previously that started a radio, R- RDO rather. Uh, they've started Juiced, not so good for them. Uh, and of course, they started Skype. Now they're moving on to something called Video. 
video.com. You can sign up right now. Uh, takes you to a page that asks you to, to sign in with your Facebook ID. If you're in the U.S., you get a uh, scary picture from Clockwork Orange that says that you can only get it in the U.K. If you're in the U.K., you get a picture that says you can sign up later. Actually, I think you get different pictures every time you sign up because we're not getting the, the <laughs> Paprika. Clockwork Orange. Paprika. Paprika. Right yeah. Uh, but, but the idea is that it would be sort of like RDO for video. Um, it's, it, it would have movies, it would have television shows, and um, there's really little else about it, but it's the guys who brought you Skype and RDO, which have been fantastic, and it's also the guys who brought you Juiced, which totally flopped. Well, but again, the technology behind Juiced was a good idea. I mean, they were, they, they, Juiced died the death of licensing, not the death of technology or an enthusiasm, because I remember when Juiced came out, I thought it was amazing. I was like, this is it. I can only watch TV on my computer now. And here it is six, seven, eight years later. And I'm like, any minute now, I'm going to be able to just watch TV on my computer. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure. There's there's a little bit of a fact that GigaOM has dug up uh, that tells you a little bit about what video does. But I, I don't get the idea that there's much yet that they can tell me that convinces me this is any different than what's already out there. I don't see the advantage yet. And if they don't well, have amazing licensing, then... It doesn't matter what their technology is. Yeah, I think it. Uh, I think it also keep in mind like this was uh, was this their hard announcement or is this a case where nah, it's they just dug leaking up out? The yeah, they yeah, put see, up a this fact, so it's a soft mm -hmm. announcement. Yeah. Uh, you can't compete with the big boys if you don't have the right content. Judging from the content that's currently teased at video, this could be different this time around. So maybe they've got the. Uh, yeah, I, I know when I went there just now, I saw Mad Men. The, the moment the the thing went up it's every time you go to put up a picture put yeah. up a video <laughs> uh anyway the fact says video lets you instantly watch the best in tv and movies right now uh currently in closed beta privately funded uh we think people will love using video how is it different from netflix and love film we think people will love using <laughs> video <laughs> more competition is good uh video and rdo are run by separate teams so we'll keep an eye on that see if we can figure out what that's actually about and then uh, finally, there was a Nielsen study out says 40% of people who, uh, who watch uh, television do so at the same time as they're playing with their iPhone and iPad, but they're not multi-screening. All these apps and things that are trying to take advantage of the fact that Glenn is sitting on his couch with his HP touchpad, not going to so work because what people are doing is checking email. Uh, they're but, surfing the web for unrelated info to what they're watching on television. They're visiting social networks to see what their friends are up to. But I like the idea of commentary tracks. Well, didn't they do that with I like all kinds of ideas, yeah. but this is what people are doing. No, they're I know, not I know. doing well, that. But, but there's not a lot of that stuff out there, though. Well, there's, there's not riff a lot of tracks. Stuff. <laughs> Rift tracks, yeah, but I mean, but well, Tron was the real big experiment with Tron Legacy of doing that with the iPad, right? Where you could be watching it and then watch along, right? And have commentary and I like stuff like that, but I think it needs to be much more widely adopted. I mean, so I, yeah, if you gave me something to do related to what I was watching, I would totally check that out for shows that I'm really hardcore about. Um, I'm wondering though, what it says. I mean, does it take into account people that are IMDBing? Something on the show, or what yeah, there's a there's a, a, a separation of surfing for content unrelated yeah. and surfing for content related. And where they find the searching for content related? Oh, I, I cl already closed the number. Uh, Do you have the number? Was, I, I actually have the stuff here, but but you guys are missing the big point. When I look at these numbers, the stuff that stood You're out to me. Missing look, big point. look at the difference here: is uh, surf for unrelated info during program versus surf for unrelated info during commercial. Yeah, it's identical. Oh yeah, because it's not Plus, like you say, oh, it's a commercial. Now I'm going to look at something on the web. Right, you know? exactly. That's shocking to me because I would have figured the opposite. Same with all the looking at your social social networking. In fact, across the board, you in general see less people surfing during commercials. Yeah, you know why? Because they're picking shopping. up the remote to press the skip button. Yeah. So they can't surf. Or, or you know, they, what I do during commercials, that's when I get up, get something to drink, you know, uh, work on uh, dishes or housework or something during commercials. Exactly. Um, but I would like to see, actually, that would be great functionality for something like Into Now, if you could not only, you know, gauge what you're watching based on the audio, but then pop up links to Wikipedia, IMDb. I mean, I was doing that today. I was watching an episode of this Canadian show, Being Erica, that I'm strangely into. It's like Quantum Leap, but a little more emotional. Um, and, you know, I was finding, I was like, oh, because it's a Canadian show, I was like, was this actor ever on Degrassi? Where I'm like going on IMDb, looking at the stuff, trying to figure it's out. The whole universe. 
universe for you. Yeah, if trying to figure out if that, if that, what else that actor had been in that I might have seen. It's a Gleniverse. It, it, it is. But I do that all the time. My wife and I do that. We'll go on Wikipedia and read about what we're watching. Yeah, yeah. Or go to the IMDb trivia page or just I, Google things. You know, I do this well, with this everything. This is a great now. question. Uh, in the chat room, Patrick Delahanty asks, what is everyone else doing other than watching us right now and, and typing in IRC? So I'm sure we'll get some answers right in there. Uh, P. Delahanty, uh, Replicant X3RO says he's watching and typing in the chat room, answering your question. <laughs> uh, he's at a bar, drinking a kilt lifter, sleeping, working, Reddit. Of course, now that, now that people are going to be funny and not all the, the answers are going to be true, but playing WoW. Watching porn. I'm, I'm glad that in the chat room I have so many supporters of Canadian television. Yeah. That I'm not the only one. Canadian and British TV is probably are your 30 percent of what I'm, I watch. You know, one thing you could be doing uh, while watching Frame Rate is watching Netflix. If you have four eyes, then you could watch stereoscopic with yes. both sides. But it's probably well, not. You could put, let's say you want to know how aluminum foil is made. You just open up a little how it's made, put it all in yeah. the corner right there, and you're learning. You're learning while you're learning. Oh, it's uh, that reminds fun. me that Netflix is a sponsor for this yes. show. Netflix.com slash twit gives you a free 30-day trial. Let's say you're intrigued by this Being Erica show that I'm talking about. It's on Netflix. Is it really? It's on Netflix. You could watch it for free for 30 days. It is a decent show. You know what's decent is telling a friend who doesn't have Netflix it's about Netflix.com slash twit. It would twit. be indecent to not tell them. Do the decent thing, people. Yeah. Give somebody 30 days free of Netflix. You'd want them to do it to you. <laughs> <laughs> the golden rule. I don't think that's Netflix slogan. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to what we're watching. Awesome Robert Young. So, well, we have some other ones. We keep playing this one. Shucks. I don't know. I, uh, that's, that's new since I've been at the controls, believe it or not. Oh, yeah, you've been, been gone weeks for me. weeks. I forgot. Uh, let's start oh, off with, with the, shall we it's, start it's, off, what, Brian? Yeah, one more thing on Netflix. Somebody in the chat room, I don't know if we can verify this, but uh, uh, Kevin Smith's Red State is now on Netflix. Is that is that for reals? I believe so, because the DVD is Dude, out. you guys got to see this movie. It, it is unlike anything else he's done, easily his best cinematic work he's ever done. I was shocked at how much I enjoyed Red State. Well, that's something you will be watching. What have you been watching? <laughs> <laughs> I've been watching a bunch of kids shows. I've been hanging As out with like, always. It's one thing or another with you. It's like, well, I haven't been watching much because I've been traveling. Or <laughs> I haven't been watching much because I have watched a bunch of kids shows. Yes, well, I've been definitely watching a lot of kids shows. And sometimes shows, you're watching but, but traveling watch kids shows. I don't even understand I what did. those are. <laughs> I did I did watch Walking Dead last night. Ah, and, and that, mm -hmm. that was the big premiere. Did you watch Walking Dead? I have not yet. Okay. Um, so, man, I have one mixed things about the season. What did you think of the opener? I thought that I couldn't understand why they made it 90 minutes long because mm -hmm. it felt like a 60 minute episode stretched to 90 minutes and maybe they did that just for uh just just for cuz they had so many advertisers yeah, uh, the no numbers kidding, came out. Eh? Uh, well I I I watched it cuz the Cardinals were busy winning the National League championship I watched it later and so I just fast forwarded through the commercials but you're right there were a lot of breaks well, and keep in mind also, uh, I, I think just Robert Young told me that uh, if I, and forgive me if I'm totally misquoting all this, but the numbers came out and it's the highest watch cable program ever. Like it's, it is ever. the most popular show in all of but cable it, television. Isn't it terrible uh, though is, that that's the casualty though in AMC and funding Mad Men and Breaking Bad, that Walking Dead has become this huge casualty creatively. It, Exactly, and and regardless, you know, like Justin, he gets super defensive when you try to blame Mad Men for uh, for Walking Dead getting the short shrift. But regardless, whether it's a money thing, whether it was a disagreement thing, whatever it was, AMC vastly mishandled uh, the, uh, the. I forgot his yeah, name. I don't again. think I you could blame Mad Men. Frank Darabont. Uh, Frank Darabont. Frank Darabont. They pissed off Frank Darabont yeah. and got him to walk off. Got him to yeah. walk off. It's not uh, Mad Men's which, fault that they pissed off Frank Darabont. It's AMC's no, AM, fault. No, it's AMC's fault. Right. AMC is, seems to not be able. I mean, they're, they're being ruined by their success. I don't know if they're being ruined. I think that's a little, little. Well, over not the, not ruined by the success, but they're not handling it correctly. I yeah. mean, they're, they're, I mean, essentially, they're in this problem where they've been a lost leader. Um, and spending all this money on original content that they can't recoup the costs. But now the problem is, what I'm saying is, the success has ruined it because now it's so successful, it has them up against a wall to where yeah. to continue well, the success, and they have to keep losing money. As, as a viewer, I find myself uh, really guarded in a way I didn't think I would be. Like, as every moment I want to love it, I just remind myself that, well, that's back when Frank Darabont still had an influence. Like, everything I see this whole <laughs> season will be the last bit of Darabontness that I get out of it. And after this, it'll be... 
whatever pale imitation, or or maybe you'll get somebody who wants to go in a new direction or something. It it just it no just one can match has, Frank Darabont. There, there has ever, not been a man born here, who can a, equal here's, his here's creative question. genius. Share some in the chat room out there as their suggestions. Has there been a, ever been a show that's been improved by changing showrunners? Yes. And I'm not talking about changing back showrunners or yeah, changing yeah. showrunners like in a later season where it was just marginally better than the middle seasons. I'm talking about I a show feel that, like you know, yes, but now I, uh, examples escape me. I think David Kelly, and this is totally, Mash. I'm such a dork for, for reaching out to this. The example I can think of is David Kelly on L.A. Law. When David Kelly took over L.A. Law from Stephen Bochco, I actually think it was better for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, and there have been st stuff like that, that maybe it was a middling success, but then somebody takes the helm and it totally rockets it. Star but we're talking about something that out of the gate was, was yeah. breaking records but with how popular David it was. David Bix uh, is saying late period Law & Order, and I agree, Law & Order got very good in its last two seasons, but I would argue that it still wasn't quite at the sweet spot it was earlier in its Star run. Trek Enterprise got better under Manny Cotto. I absolutely agree with Aurorus there, because Enterprise was, was really poor in its first mm -hmm. couple seasons. Yeah. It finished strong. And the reason we don't have many examples of this, I think, is a selection bias. Because if the show's bad, it doesn't usually have a chance to get to the point where you can change showrunners to find well, out if it would get better. But, it, but again, keep in mind also, that's not what we should be asking. Our, our question is really, has there ever been a successful show that got even more successful as a right. result? And of I think you're going to find fewer examples of that because if it's successful, there's less of a chance that they change the showrunners. Exactly. But it seems to happen, though, inexplicably. Yeah, because pe Hollywood's a funny people place. have problems figuring out you know, what it is that makes the show successful. What it is. I liked The Walking Dead opener, but I felt like it was a sagging volleyball net. Like, I really enjoyed the open. And then it was this long, sagging bit of soap opera. And then right. I really enjoyed the end. Uh, yep. and, and that goes back to what you were saying about this could have been the 30-minute episode and been freaking awesome, but instead it was stretched out over 90 minutes. Yep, agreed. And, uh, and then I also had to go back to the comic book to be like, did some of this... No, okay, none of this middle... St this would happen back... Okay, yeah, it just, like, refreshed my memory about what actually happened. Yeah, um, and, and again, with uh, being spoiler-free, is uh, is there still a character here at this po moment that shouldn't be here? Yeah, well, this there's a couple that aren't there that should be, and there's at least two that aren't there in the book for different reasons. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. If I, if I can be any more vague. No, no, I, I, I heard the code. I'm sure people yeah. who've read the comic um, book have read the code, too. Someone in the chat room was saying how long have there technically been showrunners, and it's interesting, Ken Levine, who worked on Cheers and Frasier and uh, MASH, actually, uh, he has a great blog about television, and he uh, recently posted about that sort of the era of showrunners, I guess, began in the 70s, really, uh, with Mary Tyler How did shows show. run before that? Well, they had more writing staffs, but the writing staff, really in the traditional sense of writing staff having so much control over a show, Really, that began in the 70s. He said Mary Tyler Moore is the example. Doctor Who's another example of a good show mm -hmm. that seems to have gotten at least as good, if not better, under Stephen Moffat. Yes. Uh, they, you know, they changed a very successful show with a different uh, showrunner, and it's been great. Uh, all right, I've been watching, in addition to Walking Dead, Sanctuary uh, premiered a couple weeks ago. I just caught up on it, and wow, what a strong premiere. Uh, the wow. second episode was kind of a mimic, like two, two things happening at the same time. Not quite as strong as the premiere, but it felt like all part of a whole of a, of a really good season opener. So I, I like what they're doing with Sanctuary this year. Also still watching Fringe, and I think Fringe is killing it. They're nailing it, and John Noble is the reason. He is carrying that shoulder. Really? He's carrying that show on his shoulder, uh, like, like a big Atlas guy, just like... And, and it's not even a bad show. Like he's, It's a light load, but... Uh, my metaphor is totally falling apart, but it's a really good show. <laughs> <laughs> He's carrying the heavy burden of this show that's really very light, all on his shoulder because he's so John strong. Noble. What what I'm trying to say is John Noble is a genius. Fine. And so you're not watching Terra Nova or Person of Interest anymore? No, I, uh, you know, Terra Nova, I just have, I, it's on my DVR, I just haven't gone back to it. Same for Person of Interest for different reasons. Terra Nova, mm -hmm. it's like, I want my eyes to see it, but not my brain to understand it yes. because it insults my intelligence. Person of interest, on the other hand, I really like watching Michael Emerson act, but he <laughs> needs to have a story around him, and that just seems to be missing. Yeah, um, let's see, uh, and still watching Pan Am, but barely. Yeah, I would find myself watching Pan Am, just all of a sudden, you know, I'm sleepwalking. I'm, I'm yeah, taking it's some like Ambien, I wake up, yeah. and I'm watching Pan Am. There and you go. It's not bad. Well, we were talking about this with my, my wife and I were watching it. It's shallow. It's not bad. It's just shallow. It doesn't have a, It needs more depth to really, like, make me love it.
Uh, Stan, and I've talked about Ringer already. Stan Lux asking if people are excited for community or uh, no, the, uh, for Once Upon a Time and Grimm. Yeah, oh, well, Once Upon a Time premieres this Sunday on ABC. I think Grimm Grimm's looks coming in a, on NBC yeah, I think Grimm, Grimm in a week better, and a half. Yeah, personally, if I no, say, are these are these two similar ideas competing, releasing at the same time? What's the difference between the two? What's the the elevator pitch oh, for him? Uh, Grimm is about a. For this is all I know based on the promo. It's about a cop who uh, it's a cop is, show. is a cop show, but he's investigating supernatural crimes yeah. that bear a resemblance it's to the Grimm fairy punk. tales. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's a real thing, by the way. Uh, Whereas the uh, Once Upon a Time is what, like dark retellings of fairy tales? I think it's a modern day retelling of fairy it's tales. It's like the fairy tales still exist in the modern day, so it's similar but without the crime show aspect. Um, and uh, yeah, Moo Cow, okay, so what I'm watching, uh, Community killed it last Thursday. Best episode of Community I've ever seen with uh, now, Introduction to Chaos Theory. Uh, I don't know why neither Tom and I seems to have dived into Community. I've I watched casually it. watch it. Community yeah. is a really well, good I've, show. I've really enjoyed those couple of episodes, yeah, yeah. but I've never felt compelled to go back watch and like I really last to watch Thursday's episode. They do an alternate timeline thing where they keep having the same events that play out differently based on a, a dice roll. And mm -hmm. it's one of those things where, you know, I've, after working on Lonely Girl 15 and a lot of stuff I've done, I sort of gave up on the creative dream of wanting to write for TV just for a variety of reasons. This was TV that was so good and inspired me again creatively, looking at it and saying, you know what, this is a, such a great medium. Just seeing what it can do with a 22 minute episode. Yeah. It was so funny. It was so well done. I cannot recommend it enough. Um, other stuff I've been watching, of course, Misfits, which the third season starts in the UK soon. It's on Hulu. Tom, Brian, you guys have to be watching this. You have to watch this show. It's so good. I only have so much time. It's on Hulu, man. You can check it out. It's about juvenile offenders that get superpowers. Six episodes. Wait, oh, seasons. you're talking about Misfits? No, yes. No, I've heard nothing but amazing things. Yeah, I've heard a great great six, too. Season three starts later this month in the UK. It's on Hulu now, the first two seasons. And they're six episode seasons. So easy to watch and catch up on. Very good. Also, uh, British show Luther, which has been on BBC America. Yeah, I've heard great things. They I just, just reran the miniseries. Yeah, Idris Elba from uh, The Wire and uh, The Office in the US for a short amount of time. Uh, great cop show. I actually like it better than I like the reboot of Sherlock, personally. And I like the reboot of Sherlock what? quite a bit. Watch Luther. You'll see I what I'm getting. I watched it, so I'm not going to say. But I, I find that they I'm go some skeptical. very interesting places with right. it. It's it's an unpredictable show. Aside from that, I mentioned Being Erica earlier, which uh, I don't think is going to air in the U.S. for a while. But uh, you can get past seasons on Netflix and Hulu. Um, you know, I, and with a lot of these new shows, I feel like I'm taking a wait and see approach to see what gets canceled. Because I don't want to invest in something. I mean, I feel bad that I kind of enjoyed some of Prime Suspect, aside from the aforementioned of Maria Bello and her stupid hats. Um, you know, I've enjoyed Prime Suspect, but if it gets canceled, I'm going to feel like, why did I waste my time with this? Right. Glad I didn't check out the Playboy Club, because, you know. You, you would have been left dry. Why, Let's why move on to Interfering. Uh, just a couple notes here. Boing Boing's Cory Doctorow reminding us about Pioneer One. Uh, it's a drama series with a sci-fi bent made independently and distributed online. Uh, you can get it at vodo.net. It's a BitTorrent distributed show. Uh, good production values. Uh, not the best, but, but still pretty good. Uh, and it is truly guerrilla television. There's a story being told. Uh, and they're funding it on Kickstarter. The more money they get, the more episodes they make. They've got five full-length episodes that have been released uh, with the finale for the first season to come by December once they get the money for it. So check it out. Uh, I'm so glad to see that taken off. Dot net. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to see that too. I know. I mean, back in 2004, after watching episodes of The Broken via BitTorrent with what Kevin Rose was doing there, I was thinking at the time about the potential for a BitTorrent distributed show that was crowdfunded. And yeah. it's nice to see somebody finally doing it and succeeding to a certain level. All right. All right, let's finish up with feedback. Ah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> got him. Damn you. There was another link in there. We don't have a lot of time for feedback, but we do have a video voicemail from Zap Anderson. So we'll make time for Zap. Which I highly recommend everyone else send us in video vo uh, voicemails at uh, framerishow at gmail.com. I was blown away by this. This is good stuff. Hi, Brian and Tom. I have a complaint wrapped in a question. Why do you guys have summer movies? Let me explain what I mean. This is you. This is the length of your day across the year. This is me in Sweden and the length of my day across the year. In the winter, the sun is a blink and you'll miss it affair here. 10 a.m. sunrise, 2 p.m. sunset. In the summer, it's the reverse. This is 11 p.m. sunset, and I wasn't up early enough to take a photo of the sunrise. 
We Swedes love our summers and cherish every millisecond of sunlight, which we spend outdoors frolicking in the meadows, partying, dancing in our maples and stuff. We wouldn't dream of locking ourselves in a dark movie theater at this time of year. This is the time when all the cool movies come out. And that is my problem. Not that I long back to the days of my youth with six months delays for movies, but at least when Star Wars premiered back in October of 1977, at least it was a time of year people would actually go to the fracking theater. Now I sit here in the ever-increasing darkness looking back at all the films I didn't see this summer and looking at the bleak emptiness that is the fall season movie release schedule. When it's dark and rainy and perfect for a night at the cinema, there's nothing to see. Why, guys? Why? So I actually, I feel like I'm uniquely qualified on this panel to respond to that because I spent a year and a half living in Norway. And, uh, and I've experienced, I remember reading by sunlight until 1 a.m. in the morning uh, during the summer. And uh, here in America, of course, we've got school being out. And that's when all the kids are running around. You want to have something to happen. And it's freaking kids hot go- here in it most is hotter places. Than hell. And it's always very, very cold inside the movie theater. I think those are those are the two biggest reasons. I, I mean, I wish there was more complicated this than is, that. You know, the, well, the, the biggest problem is the centralization of the movie production industry, right? Uh, you know, we, we centralize industries in certain areas of the world. You know, all of our electronics are made in China, and all of our cars are made in Germany and Japan, and all of our movies are made in Hollywood. And so that's going to be dictated by the culture of that area. You know, just like German engineering, you're going to get U.S. release schedules. Well, and I think also, I think, uh, what, 10 years ago, you were still seeing a lot of releases coming out months and months later in Europe than you did from America. But nowadays, uh, nowadays, you know, the, you're seeing simultaneous worldwide release. Right. And in certain cases, you know, they even release it overseas before it comes to America. Uh, I, I wonder if that's sort of, there's sort of a, um, a release drift that's, that's happening to where it's starting to match the uh, American calendar instead of, uh, instead of what historically they've been doing. I would tell Zap uh, that he just needs to develop a taste for Bollywood movies. <laughs> <laughs> and problem so solved. That's the simplest. I enjoy the, the music sim- and yeah. the costumes. Exactly. All right, that's it for this episode of Frame Rate. Thank you, Glenn Rubenstein, for sitting in with us. Thank Let you folks for know uh, what you're doing and what's going on. I'm uh, on Twitter, at Glenn Rubenstein, and uh, the Twit Game Show and Lamb Party. More news, in, uh, more news trickling out. More news trickling out. Brian and I this Friday, I think, are going to do a brainstorm schedule permitting. And, uh, yeah, the LAMP party. Going to be uh, working on that come November. Looking forward to that. Thank you, Brian Brushwood. A so pleasure long, as always. People. Love Frame you guys. Show at gmail.com. We'll see you later. I surrender. I give up anything, anything. <laughs>